it hit me a few years ago that almost all the interventions that we've ever done that have worked to make people happier work by making them feel more connected. Hello, and welcome to the Psychology Podcast. Today, we welcome Sonia Lubomirsky on the show. Sonia is a distinguished professor of psychology at the University of California, Riverside. Originally from Russia, she received her A.B. summa cum laude from Harvard University and her Ph.D. in social personality psychology from Stanford University. Her research has been featured in hundreds of magazines, newspapers, shows, and documentaries in North America, South America, Asia, Australia, and Europe. Dr. Lou Amursky's best-selling books, The How of Happiness and The Myths of Happiness, have been published and translated in over 16 countries. In this episode, I talked to Sonia about happiness. Across all of her research, Dr. Lubomirsky has found that connection is what makes people happy. So then, how do we form high-quality connections? Dr. Lubomirsky gives us insight on how to use kindness, reciprocity, and gratitude to maintain and strengthen our relationships. We also touch on the topics of psychedelics, interpersonal chemistry, and social media. It's always fun chatting with Sonia. She's a friend, and I really admire her research in the field. She's a real pioneer in the science of happiness. So I'm excited to share her ideas with this audience today. So without further ado, I bring you Sonia Lubomirsky. How are you doing today? I am doing amazing. How are you? I'm doing amazing. Today was the first day of school, so it's a big day. Well, thank you for taking the time to be on my humble podcast. It's a pleasure. Well, so as you know, I'm such a big fan of yours. And uh, preparing for today's episode um, and reviewing your work, it's like, wow. Like how do there's so many fascinating things to discuss. And you've been studying the topic of happiness for 30 years, hmm. more than 30 years. Yes. Is that right? Yes, in grad school. And 23 of those years, you've been studying how to increase it. Why did you get interested in this topic to begin with? You know, it was serendipitous, actually. On the very first day of graduate school, I met with my advisor, whose name is Lee Ross, um, and he is one of the world's experts on conflict and negotiation which is like the opposite of happiness. And we walked around uh, and we, I don't know who said it, probably he first said it. He said, uh, you know, what is the secret to happiness? And why are some people happier than others? And back then, mm. this was in 1989. So yeah, you did your math. So more than 30 years ago, <laughs> you know, there was only one person who really was studying ha happiness. That was Ed Diener, uh, kind of the founder of the field of happiness. Um, and there were just a few other kind of writers thinking about it. Obviously, for thousands of years, you know, thinkers and writers and poets have been talking about happiness. Uh, but empirical research was very minimum. So, yeah, so it was kind of serendipitous. Yeah, I'm trying to, like, get my head back to that time period and what was being published in psychology at the time. So there was stuff on subjective well-being, life satisfaction. Uh, Martin Seligman, had he uh, initiated no. positive psychology? No. No, that was 10 years, that was 10 years later. Yeah, because that was 1998. So there probably wasn't even uh, much talk about things like such as purpose within the umbrella of happiness, right? It, there really was a focus on... Now, of course, there's the humanistic tradition, you know, Maslow, of course. of course, that already had been talking about these sort of positive constructs. More, you know, in terms of theory than, you know, like experimental research. So I think we, you know, myself and, and many others started uh, kind of a, a very like rigorous empirical tradition, studying these positive constructs experimentally. And you wrote The Howl of Happiness. That's uh, right. Which has amazing uh, collection of activities and things we can do. Mm -hmm. When this, this discussion of happiness comes up, a lot of people ask me just how much we can change and how much is in our genes. Um, I wanted to start off with just a higher level overview of that, because you've thought of that in a really, really nuanced way. And I believe you wrote a paper with uh, mm -hmm. Ken and Sheldon um, mm -hmm. on this topic. Mm -hmm. If you could just give it a high level overview of, you know, just how much is within our control, that would be wonderful. Sure, sure. Well, you know, originally we came up, Ken and I came up with a, uh, a theory that we called the pie chart. And the, the idea there mm -hmm. is that there's sort of three main determinants of happiness, kind of like three buckets of influences on happiness. One is our genetics, you know, our personality, which is, you know, very much influenced by genetics. The second one is our life circumstances, right? Some, if you're poor, if you live in a war zone, you know, if you're in a, an abusive relationship, right, you're going to be really unhappy. Um, and then the third bucket is like what we actually can do in our daily lives to kind of maintain happiness. 
either make us happier or less happy for that matter, in terms of a kind of our daily behaviors and think in the ways that we think about things. And a long time ago, we kind of, we tried to put numbers on those three categories. And I, we think that was a mistake because, you know, we really don't know what the numbers are. Um, so now I guess our more nuanced perspective is that we still believe that there are these three types of influences on happiness. Um, genetics really are pretty powerful research with twins. Um, research that compares twins that are identical to twins that are fraternal uh, shows that there's a really high like heritability component for happiness. Like there is for almost any human trait, including yeah. love of jazz music, right? Including your blood pressure. And so identical twins are much more similar in their happiness levels than our fraternal twins. So we know that suggests that there's sort of a genetic component to happiness. So that is true, you know, that, but that doesn't mean that you're fated, right? To be a certain level. Um, our circumstances absolutely matter. But if we're kind of, you know, maybe, maybe a lot of the listeners of your podcast are like fairly comfortable, like they're not, they're not living in a war zone. Um, and so their circumstances don't affect their happiness sort of as much as probably they think they will, but they do matter, of course. And then like what I've been studying, what a lot of researchers have been studying is like, what can we actually do to change our happiness? Like, you know, can we actually change our habits? Can we actually think in ways that are different? different? And so that's like the third component. So really. All of those three components matter. All of those three buckets matter. I just, I just don't like to put numbers on them anymore. So, you know, we can't say like this percent of your happiness is due to like this factor. Yeah, because, um, you know, heritability is all about, there's so many misunderstandings of what it means. It's just, it's a population statistic. You can't parse out what percentage within a person is genetic and which parts environment. It's all connected within a person. Um, you were only talking about partitioning sources of variance technically with the heritability coefficient. Yeah, no, no. And this is consistently misinterpreted. That's why, like, we want right. to be really careful. Talking right. About genetics. But, like, for example, we know that nations differ hugely in how happy, like, the average citizen is. And that really is consistent with research on genetics because if you take the entire environment and you make it more fertile, you know, you make it, you know, more positive than, like, everyone's going to be, uh, you know, happier, uh, well, to some extent. Um, so good point. Good point, Scott. Yeah. When the environment is equalized, genetics mm -hmm. becomes more important in explaining the variance mm -hmm. in an outcome. Mm -hmm. People don't realize that either, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. like in a way, the extent to which genetics matters is the extent to which you have a just mm -hmm. and fair society. <laughs> so. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 It's just, mm -hmm. it's just, uh, it's, a, it, and, uh, and Paige Harden, uh, has done some mm -hmm. great work on that, mm -hmm. and she was on my podcast talking about mm -hmm. that. Yeah, I read um, a New York article about her that was really fascinating. Yeah. Oh, cool. So the um, idea that, that I have always resonated with, and I, and I was wondering if you could tell me what the latest thinking about it is, is the, the set point theory of happiness. Mm -hmm. It does seem like mm -hmm. we adapt quickly to uh, the, hot, the extreme highs and extreme lows in our life, and we tend to return to a sort of baseline um, level of happiness that is maybe set by the genes in terms of rea a reaction range. And I was wondering where you, your thoughts are on the our latest thinking about that. Sure, sure. So again, I think I want to offer kind of more nuanced perspective on that than I think the average person might have. Um, so the set point theory is sort of the idea that we all have kind of like a set point or like a baseline happiness, maybe in partly, you know, influence our, our genes and in our environment. And then when things happen to us, like let's say we get like a raise at work or we have a baby. Uh, or we have some kind of downturn, we lose our jobs, then our happiness kind of goes up and down, but then eventually it sort of goes back to the set point. And that process of sort of going back to our baseline, kind of what comes up must come down or what comes down must come up, is called hedonic adaptation. Mm -hmm. Now, hedonic adaptation is a pretty powerful phenomenon, right? Human beings mm -hmm. are really good at getting accustomed to changes in their lives. You can mm -hmm. argue that's evolutionarily adaptive, that like, we need to, you know, be really attuned to changes in our environments, right? We have to be attuned to sort of threats or to opportunities. But then when things are kind of the same, like we get a raise at work or we buy a new house and first we're really excited about it, but then it's sort of the same, right? Like the, our house is kind of the same every day. Our new car, you know, uh, is the same every day. Uh, we, we sort of adapt now, but research shows that we adapt much more quickly and much more completely to positive things than to negative things, right? So positive things, like I just mentioned, like we buy a new motorcycle, we buy a new bag, we um, even a relationship, right? We kind of adapt to, like research shows that people tend to adapt to marriage, you know, on average after two years, people kind of go back 
to their previous baseline. Now, of course, there's lots of individual differences there that are kind of hidden by the by the average. But with negative things like when we lose our jobs, we get divorced, we uh, we have a disability, people tend to not adapt completely to a lot of those things. They still adapt, right? So they got to go, go down mm. and they kind of start coming back up, but they don't adapt completely. So it, so our kind of quote set points, I don't really believe in set points, um, mm. but those baselines could actually change. So we could sort of permanently, you know, become like a little bit less happy, say after experiencing a disability or after unemployment, which which almost surprisingly to me, unemployment on average, people don't adapt to completely. Super interesting. Um, I think about it obviously in terms of personality psychology and and one dimension I know you've been studying recently because you've really got an interest in in connection mm-hmm. as as mm-hmm. kind of this as the, the overriding uh, central theme that runs through a lot not overriding but just a central theme that runs through a lot of um, different areas of positive psychology. Um, I'd like to double click on this introversion extroversion dimension for a second because you know we might have a set point. Um, in the sense of like, a, I don't like the idea of set point, but like a baseline, a baseline mm-hmm. a, mm-hmm. on average mm-hmm. temperament mm-hmm. that exists. Mm-hmm. That certainly exists. Some Absolutely. people are grumpy. <laughs> Some people are grumpy people. Some people are like, hey, how are you doing? And, uh, you know, those people are annoying. But, <laughs> but, but anyway, we're both that's on my the own judge. We, we are, but we're not, yeah. hopefully we're not annoyingly happy, yeah. right? Hopefully there's a, there's a difference. There's a yeah. difference. That's a new construct, annoyingly happy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> There's also. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not clapping right now. Maybe annoying happiness. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like there's a scale. We should create that scale, mm-hmm. you know. But anyway, what's so interesting to me is that you may be temperamentally an introvert, but your research shows that you can experimentally get people, regardless of whether they're temperamentally an introvert or extrovert, into certain situations, and it has effects that average over what your temperament is. Like that, over you can override your temperament mm-hmm. in in terms of the benefits of connection right. and sociality. So I'd love to hear about your research about that because it's so fascinating, so fascinating. Exactly. So first of all, just a tiny bit of background. I've been, for years I've been doing these inter- interventions where we try to make people happier uh, by experimentally kind of prompting them to engage in certain kinds of strategies or new habits, like. Try to be more grateful in your daily life, you know, do acts of kindness, uh, engage socially more with others. And it hit me a few years ago that almost all the interventions that we've ever done that have worked to make people happier work by making them feel more connected or interacting more with other people. So when you write a gratitude letter to your mom, it makes you feel more connected to your mom, right? When you do acts of kindness, it makes you feel more connected to the world in general or to the people that you're helping. Um, and so, uh, you know, what, but one of my favorite studies, so, so I think connection is really the key to happiness. So it sounds like a, such a cliche, right? But it took me like 20 years to get to the point where I'm like realizing right. connection is the key to happiness. Um, so one right. of my favorite studies I did with my former student, Seth Margolis, where we asked people for one week to act more extroverted and then the sort of try to be more extroverted than you usually are. And then the second week, try to be more introverted than you usually are. We didn't actually use those terms because they have sort of connotations um, or vice versa. And people got a lot happier during the week that they acted extroverted. They got less happier when they acted introverted. It, and it didn't matter whether they were originally kind of high or low on extroversion or introversion, which really surprised us. Like, we thought, you know, Susan Cain has this lovely work, this lovely book called Quiet. I'm sure your listeners know about it. And then she, she, you know, she argues that it's exhausting for an introvert to act extroverted. Now, in our study, we didn't make them act extroverted all the time. They could sort of choose when. And so maybe in May in a week was not that long. Now, there's another study that did something very similar coming out of Melbourne. They did find that introverts didn't benefit. They still benefited from the, inter- from the intervention to act more social. They didn't benefit as much. And also they showed bigger decreases in feelings of authenticity which does make sense, right? They felt kind of less authentic. So there's some work now, very, very new, trying to figure out like what happens when you act kind of counter dispositionally, right? Like you count, you act kind of against your personality. You might feel less authentic. I would argue you feel less authentic at first, but then over time it becomes a little bit more natural. Just like anything, when you try a new, try on a new identity or role, you know, you first, like when I became a professor, right? I felt really inauthentic. I felt like an imposter. But then over time, I just kind of got used to it. Yes. Jessie Sun uh, is doing wonderful research along those lines. Well, she did the Melbourne study. 
Mm -hmm. I know, homegirl. I know. That's why I want to give her credit. Yeah. I want to give her yeah. credit. Yeah. And I wrote about that article, uh, about her research in Scientific American, if people want to read that article. Um, but the so there's some nuances here. And I do think it's also interesting there that there was a study that came out showing that if, if you give extroverts too much socializing, they get tired too. They're not superhuman. They're not like, a, you know, like like both introverts and extroverts get exhausted with too much socializing, but their thresholds differ. Exactly. Exactly. I want to make another point is that we have another paper that is, was looking at sort of why is it lots of research shows that extroverts are happier than introverts, which by the way, that doesn't make me happy to know that finding because I kind of, I, I do agree with Susan Cain that like there's a lot of benefits to being introverted in our society and others, but they are happier. But it turns out that it's really like the energy component of extroversion. Extroversion has three components, assertiveness, sociability, which is what most people think extroversion is, but also energy level. They're sort of more energized. Enthusiastic. And so it's really the energy yeah. component that's related to happiness uh, of extroversion. Yeah. In the Big Ten model, uh, Colin DeYoung calls that enthusiasm. They, 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 yeah. they label that enthusiasm. High arousal uh, emotion. High positive emotion, really. But the, the there is research showing that, uh, that there's a modifier there, that happy introverts exist. And that happy introverts, the, the moderating factor is the extent mm -hmm. to which they have self-acceptance. Mm. So I find, I've always found that research. I, I've wrote about that as well. Mm. So funny we're talking about, I actually just, I just tweeted this out. Like the bit, so well, I retweeted someone who quoted me saying the biggest key to being a happy introvert is simply self-acceptance. Mm -hmm. yeah. so. so is that like self-compassion or uh, self no, Well, self just the, the extent to which you don't feel shame for being introvert, mm -hmm. the extent mm -hmm. to which you own it as part of your identity, you know, because there are those who read, you know, the Susan Cain's book, and then they, they make that introversion is like a really positive part of their identity, you know? Right. And their cultural differences, of course, because in other cultures, it's yeah. much more um, desirable to be introverted. Mm -hmm. But, um, but yeah, this research uh, you, you've conducted on this is, is, is so interesting, and it does show the power of social uh, connections. Um, now, social connection is not necessarily the same thing as um, what energizes extroverts, which is social novelty. So social connection in part can come with, within the agreeableness domain, perhaps. Uh, these things can be fractionated. That is true. Although, you know, there's uh, ours and other studies have, we just simply sometimes ask people to just interact more socially. So it doesn't have to be in a particular way. And um, and it's interesting, just engaging more socially makes people happier. There's some lovely work by Nick Epley and his colleagues that shows that just, you know, if you ask people to like talk to a stranger on the bus or on the train, uh, Liz Dunn has done this like at a coffee shop, people feel better. They think that it won't make them happy, but it actually does. So, so it's actually kind of amazing the power of social interactions. You know, we are, of course, social animals. And so, you know, research, you know, theory suggests that, you know, this is how like human, human, uh, I'm totally blanking, homo sapiens. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Homo sapiens. What are we called? <laughs> what are we called? Uh, yeah. Survived, like relative to other, like Homo habilis. You know what happened to them? Um, because we're social, right? The, we're social creatures, so it's not surprising that being social would be associated with with happiness and flourishing. It makes sense. It makes sense. The trauma, loss, and uncertainty of our world have led many of us to ask life's biggest questions, such as, "Who are we? What is our highest purpose?" And how do we not only live through, but thrive in the wake of tragedy, division, and challenges to our fundamental way of living? To help us all address these questions, process what this unique time in human history has meant for us personally and collectively, and emerge whole, I've collaborated with my colleague and dear friend, Dr. Jordan Feingold, MD, to bring you our forthcoming book. It's called Choose Growth, a workbook for transcending trauma, fear, and self-doubt. It's a workbook designed to guide you on a journey of committing to growth and the pursuit of self-actualization every day. It's chock full of research from humanistic psychology, positive psychology, developmental psychology, personality psychology, cognitive science, and neuropsychology. So lots of themes that you hear about on this podcast. And it's aimed to help us all integrate the many facets of ourselves and co-create our new normal with a renewed sense of strength, vitality, and hope. Whether you're healing from loss, adapting to the new normal, or simply looking ahead to life's next chapter, Choose Growth will help steer you there to deeper connection to your values, your life vision, and ultimately your most authentic self. Choose Growth will officially hit the shelves September 13th, and you can order your copy or the audiobook in the U.S. now on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, IndieBound, and all major retailers. If you're in the U.K. and Commonwealth, you can order now at bookshop.org.uk. 
We truly hope this book helps you grow and thrive and become your best self. Okay, now back to the show. What happens if you force psychopaths to be more social? Um, do they become less psychopathic? I don't think so. They probably would just use it to their, they do oh, they yeah. use it to their evil ends, right? That's true. They're very manipulative. Yeah, that's a good point. I, I want to do that study <laughs> from afar. Another fascinating area of research that you've, you've uh, been looking at lately is how MDMA can boost connection. Well, also can be a window into understanding what, what underlies feeling understood and connected. So can you tell me a little bit about some of your work on this and what you call, quote, here we go, psychedelic social psychology, end quote. I <laughs> love that. Did you coin that? I kind of want to inspire someone to start a new field called psychedelic social psychology. Yeah, I know. If someone could, uh, listeners can read. Um, so I'm really excited about this work. Um, so MDMA, the, the, the molecular name for it is 3,4-methylene dioxymethamphetamine. Um, it's otherwise called molly or ecstasy. Um, and it's a it's a compound that has has been shown both in sort of clinical trials and experimental research and also anecdotally to sort of foster feelings of closeness, warmth, trust, connection, empathy. People while they're on the drug, they feel uh, they feel grateful, they feel compassionate, they they want to help others. Really, really, really connected. And so I thought, like, what a great drug to study as a window into studying social connection. And so. Hmm. Um, when you're on the, the acute drug, the acute effects of MDMA is that people feel really like connected, really understood, valued, and cared for, which is whether well, this is called partner responsiveness theory, Perry Reese, mm -hmm. one of my favorite theories in psychology. And so studying this drug can we can be we can use it as a research tool, as like a window to try and understand like what are the psychological ingredients and what are the neurobiological roots of feeling really connected. And so that research is ongoing and some has already been done, but also we can use it in an applied way to try to improve people's lives, right? So we have a loneliness epidemic. I think the UK even uh, uh, appointed a, a minister of loneliness. Um, and so what if we give MDMA to lonely people, maybe just once, maybe with a booster, I'm not saying that we should, we need to take it repeatedly to have the effects because people say that they're really transformed when they take it because they feel so close. Um, your walls kind of come down. You're really able to sort of engage with people in a deep way. It's used for couples counseling, I think, for um, not surprisingly, because, you know, imagine a couple that's trying to like talk about conflict, you know, conflict or something that's painful. People at MDMA uh, don't feel defensive. You know, they don't feel the same kind of anxiety or fear. So, um, so it's really like kind of a beautiful molecule to, to study if you're interested in, in social connection, which of course is like a really important topic to study. Social connection is a, is a basic human need. It's really a public health concern. It's associated with health and mental health and physical health and longevity. So um, yeah, I'm really excited about this research and there's like a lot to be done. Of course, psychedelic science and psychedelic medicine is really taking off recently. Um, so there's so much more to be done in this area. Now, is this purely a theoretical interest? <laughs> uh, um, yeah, it is. Yes, it is. If you say so. Yes. Okay, if I say so. In the abstract, it says, finally, I discuss further questions um, uh, whether using MDMA for enhancing connection can backfire. And so I thought that's interesting uh, part of this paper as well. You know, um, how can that backfire? You know, I think that's, a, that's important too. Whenever you're talking about a drug, it's a Schedule One substance. And by the way, there's lots of things that are Schedule One that have been actually, I have to, that have shown to have say much less harm than things like alcohol or nicotine that are that are not schedule one, uh, which means, so schedule one means it's it's illegal, but it is being used in research and there's some really amazing research coming out right now. Um, so in terms of backfiring, yeah, we always have to be um, cognizant. So for example, if MDMA makes you feel really, really close to others, theoretically, you could, you know, be, become really close to like a, a really bad person, right? Um, or an mm. abuser, or like a a Nazi, or something, you know. So, gotcha. so we that hasn't actually happened. I I don't I'm not aware of that. Um, it could lead to like infidelity, right? It could um, uh, it could lead you maybe to feel like you have to be on the drug to feel close, right? Now, again, uh. I haven't seen that evidence in research, but I think we really need to to look at that. I'm actually really interested in backfiring effects. Like the pursuit of happiness can also have a backfiring effect. I know, I know. Yeah. So yeah, if I might say a little bit about that, I have a chapter with a student about, about how the pursuit of happiness itself can backfire, where you could, for example, 
try to be grateful, try to do acts of kindness for others. And maybe your acts of kindness kind of doesn't make people feel good, right? And so you feel kind of less competent or you might feel taken advantage of or you might feel like it's a burden. Gratitude can make people feel kind of embarrassed or ashamed for needing the help in the first place or not expressing gratitude earlier or like a burden on other people when they realize how much you know others have done for them or sometimes it's awkward to share gratitude. So, so even these really positive habits and activities could sometimes have negative effects. So I think we have to be always sort of uh, cognizant of those or aware of those possibilities. Yes, it's such an important topic that I, I want to double click on it. Um, you and Megan M. Fritz coined this term, the happiness boomerang effect, mm -hmm. um, which is exactly what you're describing mm -hmm. when positive activities uh, backfire. Not just positive activities, but can it backfire if happiness is your main goal in life? Like if you try to directly try to chase chase happiness every day of your life, can't that backfire as well? Absolutely. And actually, that's a really great question because I think a lot of people are are doing that. You know, they're like, I want to be happy. And and um, there's some really nice work by Iris Mouse and June Gruber and others that show that like overvaluing happiness, basically like really being preoccupied or kind of obsessed with like the pursuit of happiness can can actually undermine it. Right. So the idea is that like when you're constantly tracking your happiness, when you're asking yourself, am I happy yet? Am I happy yet? Right. That might actually make you feel disappointed. You know, the idea, this is kind of, a, again, like kind of hokey, but the idea is that you want to sort of enjoy the journey to get there as opposed to just sort of focused on the goal, you know, because then you'll probably be disappointed. So so I, I usually advise not to sort of focus too much on happiness, but focus on like the like the strategy. So, for example, try to be more kind to others, try to interact more, act more extroverted, be more social, be more kind, but not necessarily say I'm doing this to make myself happier. And, and is it working? Is it working? Because you might be disappointed. <laughs> yeah, no, that's exactly right. I think happiness is an epiphenomenon of other things that you uh, focus on in your life, like meaning and purpose, um, for sure. I just, I love this article you wrote, you know, with Dr. Fritz, you right? Yeah, really love this article. And, um, you, you know, you make a really interesting point in there that when someone else is the recipient of kindness, you know, like there there could be this utopian kind of idea in positive psychology it's like oh well of course you know that's going to give us well-being benefits but look we're human too mm -hmm. i mean can't like jealousy come in can't like you know like normal other human drives that positive psychologists sometimes don't they're, they're like don't even talk about that don't talk about that <laughs> you know i'm not and I, by the way, I don't like the word positive psychology because it's not it's wow. not always positive um i just kind of go where the data lead and so sometimes we find that for example we find that sometimes gratitude makes people feel a little worse it makes them feel uh, indebted, for example, right? When you're grateful to others, it makes you feel humble, which is usually a good thing. Um, um, so, you know, you mentioned jealousy. We did a study because we're interested in like social media. What if you express gratitude on social media? Um, maybe that might make people, other people feel kind of bad, you know, like, um, you know, more like when you call out people say at work, like, oh, thank you so much to Scott. He's doing such an amazing job. And then maybe your colleagues don't, you know, don't feel so good about that. Um, so uh, we're interested in sort of pursuit of happiness kind of like online too, because of course it's such a big part of our lives now. Um, yeah. Anyway, I couldn't agree with you more. Yeah. It's just, it's so important. I, I love it. You're doing this uh, and it's just, you're so productive. Um, it's, it's incredible. It's incredible. I mean, you know, it's all uh, my students and collaborators. I have the best mm, students and collaborators and they are, that helps uh, love yeah. them so much. Yes. That helps. But you know, even to, uh, with all that, uh, wonderful modesty, even aside, um, there are solo authored publications I'm looking at right now. So, 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 you know, you can't hide from your, uh, your amazingness for too long because your soul amazingness, you can't hide from it for too long. Cause even like this paper toward a new science of psychedelic sociology, it's solo authored paper. And it's, uh, it's just really brilliant, uh, really brilliant, truly brilliant how you integrate and bring together so many different threads within social psychology. You know, you have this you have a chart of the different areas which it can be impacted. Um, and I love how you mentioned creativity, by the way, because that's my area of study. Wait, sorry, is that on the chart? Creativity? Mm -hmm. You put creativity, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I have to say yeah. that paper, because I was so interested in this brand new, when I started working on it, it was about three years ago. Even then, uh, you know, psychedelic medicine hadn't really been taking off as much. But I actually ended up sending it to like 25 colleagues because I thought maybe a few of them would give me feedback and like 24 of them, and I'm not going to call out the one person who didn't give me feedback, but 24 of them 
um, gave me extensive detailed feedback was actually um, beautiful. Um, and then I, and, and I really worked hard to try to, um, to try to incorporate, you know, other people's ideas into that. So it's a, it's like a, it took a village to write that paper. I appreciate that. I do appreciate that. Well, you have a lot of projects going on in your lab right now, right? A lot of things happening. And I, I just wanted to go through and discuss some of them. Uh, one is uh, what makes for good listening. And I know it's in the very early stages of research, but it's a very important topic, one near and dear to my heart. And um, the principles of Carl Rogers, unconditional positive regard, active listening, um, a lot of that is stuff that really inspired me in his writings. And I was wondering um, what modern day science, what you're finding so far. Mm -hmm. So this is a really brand new project. We're also looking at conversations, right? Like what makes for great conversations? Because if, if the key to happiness is connection, and how do we connect? By talking to each other, basically. Mostly it involves talking. I mean, sometimes there's no talking, but there's, uh, yeah, mostly. So I'm um, working with this um, really amazing researcher from Israel, in Israel, whose name is Guy Itzchakov. Itz and I was actually just messaging with him uh, just now. Um, and he's an expert on listening. So he's teaching us a lot about listening. And he, he, talk, he, he studies what's called high quality listening. You know, and I actually, and I have lots of ideas that, you know, we, I, I want to test that we want to test, but sort of this idea that some of it, of course, is sort of maybe it might sound obvious, like the kind of nonverbal, you know, ex gestures and expressions, eye contact that you need to show, to show that you really are truly listening. The kinds of questions that you're asking, my, my own pet peeve, I mean, you're a, you know, you're a podcast co host, so you're used to asking people questions. A lot of people True. don't ask questions um, or they don't ask detailed questions that show that mm. you're really listening, that you're really getting it and that you want to know more. Right. Um, and again, getting to partners, right. That you really are, are you, that makes people feel understood. Right. So listening, the kind of listening that makes people feel really understood and valued and cared for is the kind of listening that, is, is going to improves relationships. I know it's good to know uh, that how the framework and the, and, and the way that you and your colleagues are looking at that issue is going to be so important. Um, I, I was thinking about Carl Rogers notion of active listening, which is, uh, is, is asking good questions. And well, that's what makes a good coach as well is, is powerful asking very powerful questions. And yeah, so listening is so important, right? For like, Doctor patient relationships, right? Therapist uh, client relationships, student teacher relationships, romantic relationships, friendships, right? It's just so important. So I, I'm really excited about the sort of new line um, that we're sort of jumping into. I'm excited that you're looking into that. Um, I saw a very interesting study the other day that tried to quantify what the optimal amount of talking is for a conversation for the for the other partner to perceive you as a good conversation partner. And I actually found, uh, and the researchers actually found that people tend to underestimate um, how much talking they should actually mm -hmm. do in a conversation, that mm -hmm. people who talk more than, than they think they should um, are actually perceived as more confident and, and actually the other, the, the other person enjoys the conversation more. So um, that's kind of the interesting other side of the coin. You know, listening is important, but maybe too much. Again, it goes back to your backfire effect. Yeah. Backfire effect. Too much listening can yeah. be like, geez, do you have uh, you have anything to say yourself? <laughs> right. right. It has to be reciprocal. And there's this paradigm um, called fast friends where it's used in research. It's also used sort of in applied context where people kind of ask each other a series of increasingly personal questions. But what's and so it's because self-disclosure is really important too, right? Because it has if you're self-disclosing, you're really showing a part of yourself. Um, it's, you can't really feel understood if the other person doesn't really see what you truly are like inside. Um, but it has to be, uh, what's the word symmetric, right? Like if you're doing all the talking or if you're one person you know, listening, it feels uneven, right? And so it has to be symmetric. So this fast friends, uh, procedure, people take turns, right? So I might ask you, you know, a personal question, like when was the last time you cried in front of someone? And you might yes. answer that question. And then I really listen, might follow up. And then you, and then I, it's my turn to answer the same question. Yes. And so that kind of reciprocation is really important to having like a deep connection. A hundred percent. And also, uh, well, trust, trust is a really valuable one uh, within, within a high quality connection. How much do you like uh, or studied um, uh, or rely or draw on the work of Jane Dudden uh, and high quality connections. Yeah, absolutely. So I've, I've read her work, right? So yeah, high quality HQCs, right? High quality connections. Um, correct, correct. Right, and so she has a, a theory of sort of what makes up for high quality connections that are that is really relevant, right? To what we're studying. We're trying to sort of draw on 
everything there is uh, on this in this re research for so R Bob Rosenthal, for example, is one of my colleagues at UC Riverside, where I am a professor. He a long time ago he did research on rapport, and so he had a theory of sort of here are three aspects of rapport, including like synchrony. We haven't talked about synchrony, but that's no, an you're right. Part of connection, you know, we're kind of mirroring each other's gestures or movements. And so that's part of like having rapport. So that's also part of having, and I believe that's also part of um, uh, Jane Dutton's work. And then Barb Fredrickson has work on what she calls positivity resonance, which is also sort of a theory about sort of sharing kind of uh, positive, uh, positive emotion, positivity. Although I, you know, we argue that if you could have uh, you could have sort of this resonance or um, feeling in sync, even when it's not positive, right? Imagine mm. shared grief, you know, or like shared anger and injustice, right? Um, so you could have sort of negative, I don't know what to call it exactly, negative resonance. But anyway, uh, yeah, so like really, I think it's really important to sort of stand on the shoulders of, of giants and see like what they have written and then kind of try to extend beyond what they have done. And again, my my MO is to do experimental research. So we try to sort of test things that maybe have been shown um, like naturalistically happen in real life. And then we try to bring them in and sort of uh, manipulate them to see if like, if you get people to sort of listen in this way, or if you get people to, uh, you know, interact in this way, will they, um, you know, will they become happier? I love it. Also uh, relates to Sarah Aljo's work, positive interpersonal processes. Right. Bind, what is it? Bind, find, and remind, or is it bind, mm -hmm. bind, and remind theory? So, absolutely. So, the, and she talks, for example, what's really relevant to us is the role of gratitude in relationships. And then basically, yes. she posits that the main function of gratitude is actually to kind of uh, maintain and like strengthen social relationships. Um, so, yeah, absolutely, really, really relevant work. Love it. Um, I'm also super interested in your work on interpersonal chemistry. Mm. And, and how to create it. Because don't you talk to people sometimes and you feel a severe lack of interpersonal chemistry off the bat? And you kind of like, you know, you check your watch, you like look for the exit. What's going on there? Yeah, so I have quite a bit to say about chemistry. We have, so Harry Reese, who's the um, uh, sort of the, de who developed partner responsiveness theory, right? Which is the importance of feeling understood and cared for and uh, valued. So he and I and my student, Annie Regan, uh, wrote a paper that kind of presented a theory of chemistry because we, I, I believe no one had actually like kind of just visually kind of described what chemistry is. And so basically we propose that there's kind of two aspects of chemistry, what chemistry kind of looks like, you know, when you see it, like when you see chemistry, sometimes you see two people talking you're, and that's basically a series of what we call responsive interactions where I sort of say something and you really, you respond in a way, you listen in a way they make me really feel understood and cared for and appreciated. And then like, and then I do the same to you. So we have this sort of this interaction uh, that, that yep. keeps going. But then what does chemistry actually feel like? So, and I can kind of throw this out to your listeners. Like when you've had, when you've experienced chemistry with a person or with a group for that matter, or like a sports team, what does it feel like? Well, there's sort of three components. One is it feels good. You know, it feels positive. There's sort of liking, attraction, warmth. Another is you feel a sense of like shared identity, like or similarity, right? You're like on the same team or you're a couple. Um, and then the third is you're typically, you're pursuing goals. You know, so like if you and I have chemistry right now talking, we have kind of a shared goal in mind, which is this conversation or this podcast. You have sort of these shared mutually, you know, um, interdependent goals. But like we really, Harry and Andy and I really believe that chemistry is something that can be built. You know, it's not like, mm. oh, you either have it or you don't, just like happiness. Um, it's not easy, right? So I, my example is like, I have to, you know, I have a lot of kids, I have four kids. And so I, I've been to a lot of like kid birthday parties <laughs> and I don't love going to kid birthday parties because you're just kind of stuck talking to people that you don't, don't really know, you know, these other parents. And so like, let's say you're sort of talking to this other parent and they're not like that interesting to talk to. How do you draw them out, right? How do you build chemistry with them? Well, self-disclosure is important. So how do you get to kind of get them to disclose? So then you disclose and maybe you start asking them questions. You know, I remember talking mm -hmm. to someone who wasn't that interested in it. And so I was like, but I said, well, have you traveled? What's your favorite place where you traveled to? And he said, Greece. And actually I've never mm -hmm. been to Greece. So I was like, well, tell me about that. What is Greece really like? Well, you know. And so we ended up having a really nice conversation that had a little chemistry with it in it. You know, we kind of felt like, oh, felt a little bit in sync. 
By the way, feeling in yeah. sync is probably the most the key to chemistry. Synchrony. In terms of a yes. Yeah. But it sounds like these other things are precursors to synchrony. It seems like synchrony is more an outcome. Or like a, it's a symptom. Emergence. Like, like, yeah. Emergence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These are all emergent phenomena. So um, yeah. I think it's debatable, right? Like sort of where in the time yeah. course this can happen. We kind of debated that a lot. So um, yeah, we could talk about that, sort of the nuances there. You know, I love nuance. Um, I mean, this is a, such a groundbreaking paper, um, you know, because you and you distinguish between what chemistry looks like mm -hmm. versus what it feels like. Mm -hmm. Now, these two things can come apart, right? Like, you know, you can have all the people in the media be like, oh, uh, Mary Sue and John, the mm -hmm. two celebrities, you know, mm -hmm. like, look at their amazing chemistry they have and they'll be together forever. And then they get divorced the following week. So sometimes uh, these things can come apart, right? Our perceptions can be different from how people actually experience it. And no, it's true. That's true. We can certainly be wrong. But again, when I, when we say what chem chemistry looks like, that's when I'm talking about that those those interactions, right? So you really need to see Mary and John in conversation and really kind of be a fly on the wall. So not just kind of them like taking photos together, but like really see like when they're having that conversation, are they making, are they kind of like throwing the ball back and forth in a way that makes them feel like they're, they're feeling understood and appreciated. They really are, um, uh, you know, in sync with each other. So, but I agree. Sometimes we could just be wrong. We can be, yeah. we can be. Okay. Can we be wrong too? Like in terms of our own perception? Like, it's like, what if I'm, so what if I'm like, oh, wow. You know, Sonia, I think we're having such amazing chemistry right now. And you're like, Scott, nah, yeah. nah. It's actually a question that we even maybe have it somewhere in the paper we considered can it can chemistry be one sided right like you feel That's what like I'm reason. saying. Yeah, exactly. That's what I asked. And can I exactly? I know that's why yeah, that's why I brought it up. So um <laughs> so but we don't really know. Like I think it's debatable like is it really chemistry when only one person feels it? But I think we kind of settled on like maybe yes. Like if you really feel you have all the sort of symptoms of chemistry, you're feeling the chemistry. You know, and I'm not feeling it. Uh, or vice versa. You're not feeling it. I, I'm feeling. I'm feeling. I was just. I was just joking. I'm feeling amazing chemistry right now. <laughs> I think. Okay. And if I want to compliment you, Scott, I think your superpower is that you make people feel like at ease. You're very easy to talk to, and I think actually that's one like channel into chemistry, mm -hmm. right? You know, people who are kind of awkward and they don't say much yeah. and they sort of pause and they kind of look at you. You know, it's harder to develop chemistry with them, and you you have a, a an thank ease, you. You know, thank you. I really appreciate that. Well, pe people should know. You know, that we were friends in real life. We're friends in real life. Yeah, we are friends in real life. People might not know that, so I, th I, this is not as awkward as it sounded. Full disclosure: We are friends in real life, although new friends. Okay, so what is this idea of um, you know, that you can count too many blessings? I find that research fasting. I saw you actually at a NIPA conference talk about that research mm. uh, like six years ago, um, and it fascinated me ever since. And we still don't have all the data. Uh, okay, fair enough. <laughs> can you count too many blessings? Okay, so there's there's a phenomenon in social psychology called the effort as information heuristic. Okay, effort as information heuristic. And the classic study was done by Norbert Schwartz at USC. And they asked people, I think, I don't remember the numbers, but something like list like five assertive behaviors that you have done recently, like assertive behaviors, or list like 15 assertive behaviors. So the more people, the more behaviors people are forced to list, the less assertive they think they are, because it's harder for them to think of 15 assertive behaviors. Or you ask college huh. students at the end of a class, uh, list like 12 things you liked about your professor or list three things you liked about a professor. The people who list or are asked to list 12 things actually don't like the professor as much overall because it's hard for huh. them to think of 12 things. So could that be true for counting blessings, right? If I ask you to think of like 20 things that are good in your life right now, and maybe you have some trouble coming up with 20 things you might conclude that your life is not as fortunate as you thought it was. Um, and also it could just be kind of a burden. Um, so we did a study where we asked people to count two blessings, four blessings, or eight or 16 or 32 blessings and, mm -hmm. and sort of measured their affect. And we found that the, what do you think was the Goldilocks kind of number of blessings? Two, four, eight, 16, or 32? I was going to say eight. You know, I, I, I thought it'd be four, um, mm -hmm. but eight, eight is actually the right answer. Uh, it felt it intuitively felt right to me. 
but we are trying to replicate that study. We haven't been able to replicate it. So, you know, mm. just full disclosure, we'll see what happens if that's, that's a real effect or not. It's such a valuable nuance within the field that says like, count your blessings. You know, it's like, <laughs> yeah. Another nuance in the field. Again, my student Annie did a, a study for her like master's thesis where we, she compared what's, what's sort of more happiness promoting for gratitude, writing a gratitude letter or like gratitude list, right? Counting kind of your blessings. And it turns out that letters or kind of essays are more happiness inducing than lists. And I think it's not that surprising when you're writing like a whole essay, it's more meaningful, it's more rich, right? You can talk about like, oh, my mom has done all these things for me. If it's just a list, it's sort of not as, it's a little bit more trivial. That makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I know a topic you could go on all day about is the use of smartphones and social media um, and how it's uh, making us maybe unhappy in some ways. Can you talk about the research you found on the association between these things? Yeah, I'm going to try to, yeah, and I'm going to try to be sort of brief. Um, so another former student, Lisa Walsh, this is going to be, this is sort of her um, wheelhouse. And um, she did a dissertation. So we, there's lots of research on this. You know, Jean Twenge published a lot of research yeah. showing that, you know, smartphone use is, or technology, uh, yeah, I would say social, uh, digital media use is associated with lower well-being, more suicidality, you know, more depression, especially in girls and really maybe only in girls, boys tend to video play video, video games that are more social. Anything that's sort of more social tends to be happiness inducing or at least not reducing. So especially in girls and especially in teen and tween girls, that's where you kind of see the negative correlations. Other researchers show or try to argue that the correlations are really tiny. So there's sort of this debate about like, are they really tiny? I mean, they are tiny, but like, does that matter? And Jean Twenge, uh, uh, full disclosure, is also a friend of mine and a collaborator. Mm. She argues, no, no, the, even, even though these are small correlations, they really do matter, uh, especially yeah. when you break them down by gender and age. So there's a debate, you know. So again, my take on the debate is that smartphone use, but particular social media use, does seem to be negatively associated with well-being, but this is mostly true for girls and for young girls. Okay, so that's sort of my take on the literature. Now, those are all correlations, right? So it could be that, you know, if you're depressed to begin with, you're going to use social media more. No, mixed evidence on that. So really, we need to do experimental research. So there's some studies on this. So, so Lisa did for her dissertation a big experiment where she asked people to, for a week or about eight days to give up their hmm. smartphone use as much as possible or their social media use. So she actually had, it's actually kind of brilliant dissertation. She had four groups. Uh, either you are asked to as much as possible get off all digital media, all smartphone hmm. use. Now, of course, like if you have to absolutely do something for work or, you know, or check Facebook because there's an event happening and you want to know where it is, that's okay. So one condition, they're giving up as much as possible their, their digital media use. Another condition, they're just only giving up social media use. Another condition, they're sort of not doing anything. We're just tracking them. And then we wanted to have a control condition where people are kind of like giving up something that maybe makes them feel a little bit good. And it was really hard to come up with that, right? Because we thought like maybe they should give up sugar or, but it doesn't work for everyone. So actually my teenage daughter had the idea as to use less water, right? So we live in California. Water is really, well, in lots of places, it's very valuable. So, you know, whatever you not drink less water, use less water. Um, yeah. And so, but. So what we found was that, um, you know, it, we didn't have big effects. Um, we did find just with the reducing social media, some positive effects of reducing social media. We did actually find a really interesting correlation. We look at correlations between uses of these different technologies and well-being. And by the way, the uses were tracked uh, by what's it called? A screen time app in iPhone. So oh. this was like very right. hardcore, rigorous tracking. This isn't self-report like, yeah. you know. Because people don't know right. how much, like, how many hours did you use your phone today, right? You, right. you don't know, right? Um, and it turned out right. that some apps were associated with less happiness and some were more or not, or, or not associated. And the less was like Twitter, Facebook, more happiness, Snapchat. I mean, we don't know why. And I'm not like, an, I'm not like a promoter of that company, but um, that was kind of interesting finding. What about TikTok? Um, I'll have to look that up. I think, yeah, in fact, I can look it up now. If, uh, it's so popular. Yeah, it's I so know. Popular. TikTok is maybe the most popular. Um, what about Instagram yeah. versus Twitter? 
I think both of them were ne negatively associated with happiness. Yeah, because I see that with Twitter, but I feel yeah. like Instagram's happy. I feel like people on Instagram are happier, like just in terms of the way they write and talk to each other. That's all. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we didn't find that in terms of their own happiness, but maybe like positivity. If you code, is that what you're saying? Kind of if you code positivity in people's posts. I don't know what I'm saying. It just seems like Instagram. Well, what I'm saying is it seems yeah. like from my experience yeah. that people are happier on Instagram. People are grumpier on Twitter. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> There's lots more heart works. emoticons on yeah. Instagram. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so the positive relations with happiness are uh, gaming apps, right? So because, again, they're more social. News Real app, actually. Yeah, Camera app is positive associated with happiness. That makes sense because you're kind of taking photos and Snapchat is positive associated with happiness. Negative associations that are that are actually significant are let's see, dating apps, uh, oh. Tinder, Twitter, Safari, Mail, Facebook, Blackboard. That's funny, WeChat. It's, Blackboard is the one that you know college students use. So I guess they're <laughs> yeah, yeah, that makes sense. But not not Instagram. Uh, let's see where Instagram is. I think Instagram is just not significantly related to. Huh. Uh, oh yeah, here it is. Instagram, negative but not. It's basically zero, and TikTok is also the same as Instagram. It's basically zero correlation with happiness. So interesting, and and as you said, it really probably matters when you break it down to the demographics even more, um, by uh, age and gender and uh, other demographics. Right, our participants in this study were all what are called iGen or Gen Z, because that's the, that's the um, you know, population we're kind of more worried about. But yeah, we'd love to do something with like uh, across, you know, lots of age groups. Yeah, it'd be really important research. Um, really important. The last question I wanted to ask you is um, this connection between uh, mind and body. I know you've mm -hmm. done some physiological and uh, well, hormone markers and various things. How can acts of kindness boost our immune profile? And then how have you investigated that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm super excited about this work. So this is work Me with my, my students and former students. Thank you. And a, actually a former um, grad school buddy and friend named Steve Cole, um, who is a social psychologist who retrained as an immunologist. Uh, he's at UCLA. Um, and so he does what are called genomic analyses, looking at RNA gene expression. So We've now have two different studies because we, we replicated the first where we ask people, again, it's an experiment. We ask people to do acts of kindness for others. So we have one group, do acts of kindness for others. Another group, do acts of kindness for yourself, which I think is a great comparison condition because it makes mm -hmm. you feel good in the moment to kind of treat yourself to like a massage or a candy bar or something or nap. Um, and then we also have sort of a group that sort of tracks their activities. So they're kind of trying to organize their time, but it's, it's kind of fairly neutral. Um, yeah. And what we find is that only the group that it does acts of kindness for others is over a period mm -hmm. of four weeks. We collect their blood spots, their blood before and after the intervention. Only that group uh, shows changes in their RNA gene expression that are associated with a healthier immune profile. So they're they, they show less pro-inflammatory gene expression. So think inflammation, more inflammation is bad. So we have less pro-inflammatory gene expression. We have some indication in the second study of, of well, we're not sure about, the, of more antiviral gene expression. So um, really, really cool. Wow. So again, doing acts of kindness for others leads people to show in their blood sort of down-regulation of pro-inflammatory genes. Uh, so we're super excited about that. I am super duper excited about that. Uh, <laughs> we, we need to get the word out there. Uh, you know, in this in, in this environment of uh, lots of divisiveness and um, yeah, that that, that uh, kindness matters. So yeah, so do so helping others makes you really makes you happy, but it maybe might even prevent you from from catching viruses or getting sick. But we don't know that because this is just a marker, right? So we we actually are not looking at kind of quote real health. Thank you for that uh, nerdy caveat, Sonia. It is. Amazing to have you finally on the Psychology Podcast. Um, I Why am, haven't you asked me uh, to be on it before? I, I know. Uh, well, yeah, I have. Start? But you know I have. <laughs> I have. You've been, you're have a busy human. Before? Yeah, yeah. You're, you're a busy human. But I'm um, uh, honored to call you a friend. Um, and yeah, I'm just, I'm so, I'm so uh, enamored by your career. And uh, I mean, you are legitimately a legend. 
<laughs> in the field of psychology. You're a legend. <laughs> Thank you, Scott. No, I love doing this work. And again, my students are the best part of it because of, you know, because of connection, right? The best part of it is working with other humans, right? With my students and collaborators and, and doing this kind of thing, like talking, talking to you, talking to other people to disseminate the science is really super fun. Can't wait to get this out there. Thanks. Thank you. Pleasure. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Psychology Podcast. If you'd like to react in some way to something you heard, I encourage you to join in the discussion at thepsychologypodcast.com or on our YouTube page, The Psychology Podcast. We also put up some videos of some episodes on our YouTube page as well, so you'll want to check that out. Thanks for being such a great supporter of the show, and tune in next time for more on the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity.